Right. Uh, that's, not, that's not bad attendance. This is better than my lectures normally are. Uh, so I'm Sean McKeown. I work at this lovely institution, not on this campus typically. Um, do forensics-related things, mostly involving images, which is exactly why I'm talking about it today. So I, I have changed the name of the title slightly. Uh, so identifying similar images, yep, okay, same. But it's an introduction to perceptual hashes and their evaluation now, rather than just, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes. There we go, one button, good. Uh, right, yeah, so identifying similar images, introduction to perceptual hashing and their evaluation. So not just the evaluation, but I thought most people probably don't know that much about perceptual hashes, so we'll start by talking about that first, and then we'll work up to the kind of sciencey bit at the end. But first, I thought it may be worth talking about why we might want to do matching in the first place, right? So there's, there's loads of use cases, and there are slightly different techniques that go with all these different approaches, but basically, you might want to deduplicate, for example, right? So if you're a cloud service provider, like OneDrive or you know, Dropbox, or whatever it is, and you've got the same cat picture, you don't want to be storing that 10,000 times, 100,000 times, that's a waste of space. So what you'll typically do is you'll look at blocks or you'll look at files and you'll deduplicate that by generating some signature for it, looking it up and saying, oh, we have that already, let's just point at it instead. So this new account has that file, point over there, done, right, we don't need to copy it. So deduplication of all your, your cat pictures, and that's Sushi, Sushi the cat, it's my favorite picture of her in a little box. You could also verify files, identify you know, integrity of a file, or identify a previously known file. So this is somewhat similar to what your antivirus is doing. Uh, it's looking and saying, have we seen this before? These days it also says, have we seen this behavior before, which is slightly different. Uh, if you want to check your downloads integrity, for example, you've got off of a maybe slightly sketchy site, and you check that the MD5 or whatever is the same as what's on the original website, you're probably fine. Maybe not with just MD5, but we'll forget that for a bit. Uh, you might want to detect malware, right? So if you've got, uh, this is where your IOCs come in, right? So you've got your SOC, you've got your, your EDR system. You see a file you've seen before, yeah, we don't want that. We've identified that. But it might be something that we've only kind of seen before, because maybe it's a variant on some malware we've seen before, right? So this is where it gets interesting, because we're not necessarily just looking at Sorry, I'm trying to find the sweet spot on the mic so it doesn't all the time. We're not necessarily looking at the exact same binary. We're looking at something that might be very similar but not the same most of the time. Or maybe just the same family, right? So we're actually thinking about what matching means a little bit in that case. And turn it in, right? Turn it in uh, if you're doing student assignments. We kind of need this just to make sure you've not plagiarized. These days they've got some AI detection stuff built in as well. But that's effectively doing similarity matching of a kind, right? So have we seen this text or very similar text before? And then we've got reverse image search, right? So I hope Bill doesn't mind me using his image. Uh, but basically, you can give it an image and say, right, what other images out there look like this one? And again, that brings up the idea of what it really means to be similar. Because the top left one on that, in fact, let me get the, uh, the pointer up. This one up here, that's probably the same, right? It might actually be the exact same image. The one on the right, it might be the same picture, but it's black and white and it's cropped differently. Is that the same? Is that, is that the same image? Uh, this one and that one, probably the same picture as far as we're concerned, but cropped differently, right? So we're, we're thinking a little bit about what matching actually means there. And we'll come back to that idea in a minute. Because the, the typical way of doing this, and I come at it from a digital forensics point of view, I'm kind of going to cover some other angles, but that's ultimately where I'm going to end up. You take a file, you hash it using SHA256, two, two, I can't remember, 256, SHA1, MD5, any of that stuff, cryptographic hashes. You get some unique identifying fingerprint, sequence of hex, and you either look that up or you know what you're looking for because it's the same as the download case, right? We know what string we're looking for. But the problem with that is you're, you're matching it exactly. You're matching this exact picture of this majestic uh, unicorn in Glasgow, right? If we modified that in any way, or we just had a slightly different picture, or we recompressed it or something like that, it wouldn't be the same picture anymore, even if it looks the same to us. And that's the tricky part, right? Because with traditional cryptographic hashing, if you change a bit, in this case it's actually three bits, because I've picked this poorly, but you know, we're changing one number, essentially, in that sequence, ultimately re resulting in a very small difference, right? But 
cryptographic hashes point in totally different directions. These are totally different hashes. You couldn't tell that they're part of the same text. Well, you may think, well, there must be ways of doing it with binary, right? We can look at similar binary. So, yeah, okay, there, oh, actually, I'm skipping ahead, sorry. Uh, but that's, that's exact, right? A lot of the time, okay, for integrity matching, this, this file I've downloaded, I want to make sure it's the same one. Exact matching is brilliant. But for the cases where we're, we might want a little bit of leeway, it's, it's not going to work, right? We need something else. And that comes back to, we probably want to match all of those ones that I've pointed out here. They're probably matches for most of our considerations. And in fact, because these are all bill, for some definition of match, all of those are matches, right? But we usually, we're looking at a bit more of a tight scope than that, in the, in the sort of forensics use case at least. So what we need to do is say, well, okay, well, let's compare similar binary looking blobs. And there's a bunch of algorithms for doing that. They're called bitewise approximate matching. You might have heard of SD hash or SSD for that kind of thing, frequently used for uh, clustering, you know, lots of malware research uses these kind of things. And the idea is that if I give you a bunch of similar bytes, in this case, again, text, and I change a little bit of it, right? So I, I change that last sentence, then ideally they should be very similar given the hash. And we see that here. So this is, uh, I forget which one this is now. It doesn't particularly matter, it's probably SD hash. Most of that hash is the same. We've got a little bit at the end that's different, right? That's good, that, that's roughly what we'd want. It points in the same direction, they're not totally different things. What have we tried that in images? Well, I, I guess it's SSD. Yeah, there we go, it's SSD. If I take a PNG and I add a little bit of white space at the bottom, I've not changed it substantially, right? We'd still look at the image and say, this is the same thing. And the, the pink highlight there is just two overlaid images and that's the difference between them, right? So they're fundamentally identical apart from this white bar at the bottom, which shows up as pink because that's the difference. When we do SSD on those, it's much the same. It's very much an agreement that most of this is the same. And there's a little bit of a difference, right? So that, that's looking pretty good. That's looking like we could probably find similar images using this approach. Except it doesn't always work and it falls over quite frequently when it comes to images. Because anyone that knows how JPEG compression work, and if you've ever listened to me talk about it, you'll know roughly how it works, because I go on and on about it a little bit. JPEGs compression means that you can propagate these changes all the way across. And when you edit a JPEG, you're actually recompressing all of that data again. So what you end up doing is making all these small changes all the way through the image, right? That's what all these pink uh, clouds, I guess, are. So all I did was add that little spaceship in the top, but you see all this propagated stuff all the way through the rest of the image. So if I'm looking at binary data and I'm comparing binary data, that's not any use. And this is actually the easy case, right? I've barely changed that image. All I've done is re-encode it, all of a sudden this technique doesn't work. So re-encoding is easy. What have you rotated or cropped it, right? These are much more substantially different things. Uh, if you've ever been on YouTube, for example, right? There's content matching, there's, there's automated content matching to say, you can't put that on your YouTube, that's copyrighted by Bandai Namco or whoever happens to be the publisher for Naruto in this region. Uh, they put borders around them instead, right? So what they do is they say, right, they're gonna see this is exactly the same thing they've seen before. So we'll add a border, or we'll project the background onto the back, or we'll flip it on the, the x-axis, right? So everything's backwards, and sometimes the subtitles are backwards as well, which isn't particularly useful. But this is a real thing, right? These are real attacks, and actually, if you think about the pixels now, all the pixels are kind of flipped around or shifted, so they're all quite different as well. It's not just that binary representation anymore. And we can do other things like rescale, and Pretty much anything you can think of, right? But they're kind of usual things, the crop and flip and rotate, that sort of thing. So we need a, a solution for media files, for, for images, for video, not really audio in this case, that doesn't really care about that binary aspect of it because compression and all of these changes mean that the binary data doesn't look the same anymore. So what we're now thinking is, well, how do we, how do we manage that? I can tell that's Naruto, I can tell that's Kakashi, I actually know which episode it's from, which is kind of sad. Uh, but how would a computer be able to do that afterwards? So we've got this idea of semantic approximate matching, right? So computers look at binary, how do we make them look at the, the thing we care about? The, the human facing content, for lack of a better term, right? So for text documents, we do this all the time. Anytime you use a search engine, you're doing similarity matching in the domain of text, right? Words. Bing, Google does all that stuff. 
If you're looking at audio, uh, I don't know what the song is, but I'm sure I've heard this before, and you, you get Shazam and you, you press it. That's, that's an audio fingerprint of that song. And all it's doing is trying to match that fingerprint to a database of known things. So you can do it for sound, and obviously you can do it for image and video, and based on how it looks. And we've already seen that that's possible based on the reverse image search thing we had for uh, Bill earlier. So that subset, if you've been wondering, well, what is perceptual hashing? The subset of that semantic human-facing bit, this visual, is perceptual, perceptual hashing. So we want to generate that string that we can look up and say, find similar things to this, and have it be similar in some dimension. And it should handle you know, that re-encoding case and all the other sort of flips and crops and that sort of thing. But the problem is you're not going to manage that all at once, right? There's too many different types of manipulation there that you're, you're probably not going to do well at all of them all at once. So this is where the evaluation bit comes in. Because if I say, oh, yes, we've got this really good technique for detecting illegal images, and I say, well, how good is it at being, you know, have a crop the image or a rotate it or flip it, any of that? That data might be fairly difficult to get. You know, is it actually robust to these things? How often does it work? What if I combine these things together? We need to evaluate to make sure that they actually do what we think they do in the context we're using. So what about perceptual hashing then? So this, this is where I'm going to crowdsource some ideas quickly, right? So how might you match an image visually? So for example, right, all of these images down the bottom right are from a reverse image search of that picture. So how do we arrive at that? What kind of features do you think we might use? Any ideas? How would we match it if we're looking at it? What would we, what would we be interested in when we're looking at it to say they're the same thing, roughly? Shape and colour. Shape and colour. What else? Sorry, was that just the same? But you can bring that down a little bit more, right? But yeah, that's, that's fundamentally it. We've actually got like two different visual systems in our brain. One is really about you know, orientation and shape and rough, rough area. And then the more recent one processes all that stuff with color and texture and features and all that fine grained detail. But that's, that's basically it, right? For us, it's about pattern matching on those high level features. And we can actually do object recognition and all that other stuff afterwards as well. But if you think about it, there's actually tons of ways we could think, how do we turn a set of RGB grid pixels into something we can compare, right? So color is a good one. We'll start with color, because that is actually how a lot of the older systems did it. You'd effectively say, right, what are the RGB values? Count how many of each there are. Build a histogram. Compare these histograms together. So things like uh, color hash is one of the ones I'll show you a bit later on. Color hash does that. The old uh, reverse image searches did that. But it's not very good, and it's, it's global, right? So my view is quite different from yours. You're seeing mostly white and black. I'm seeing a lot of blue. So if I take a picture here and I build a histogram of that, I basically get anything that looks blue. I'm kind of losing all that information about where it is. So there's other methods that say, right, why don't I take this scene, split it up into a grid, and for each of those grid points, I'll take the average color of that. And now I'm getting positional information, right? So top left, that's that sort of woody color, then I've got blue next to it, then I've got white, then I've got something else. I can now kind of get a representation of what that scene looks like. Much better than just, yeah, it's got blue in it. So again, for you, that would be kind of black at the top, white at the bottom, maybe a bit of blob of red over there. But there's, there's way more ways of doing it, right? So uh, textures and edges. There's a, a system called PhotoDNA that Microsoft uses, and this is what most of your cloud service providers are using. So when you, you upload something to uh, OneDrive, right, they're not messing about. They're scanning that stuff to make sure, you're, make sure you're not uploading dodgy images like Basil was talking about earlier. So PhotoDNA looks at edges and texture and that sort of thing. There's other solutions that might be based on, have you ever heard of SIFT? That's a feature point detection. So you're really trying to understand what's the important visual point in that image. And there's, there's going to be more than that, right? That's just a quick, this is what we could do. The right-hand side, you might have seen, has got a bunch of question marks, because what does transform domain mean? Well, it's just a technical way of saying we transform the pixels into something else. And that something else is normally frequencies. And if, again, you've ever heard me talk about JPEG and how it works, then you've heard about discrete cosine transform, which changes pixels into frequencies using a bunch of magic base functions, which is basically magic. And we derive features from there instead. It reshapes the energy. We get a bunch of low energy stuff at the top left and the high energy at the bottom right. And it kind of manipulates, uh, mimics our visual system. We're not really good at seeing loads of small change. We can see big change, right? So look at that wall. It's mostly white, about the same, kind of slow, gradual changes. 
If I went up and put lots of dots on it, you probably wouldn't see it from very far away, right? That's, that's the sort of high frequency change. So PHash and PDQ, which is the Facebook's enhancement of uh, uh, PHash, does that. Uh, there's other transformations as well. So if you want to do like a wavelet transform, if you get things like WHash, and there's a couple of other ones like Fourier, Fast Fourier transform, and Radon transform. And again, I'm just mentioning these. You don't have to know what any of that is. Radon transform is kind of interesting though because it's like projectile lines, like a spokes of a wheel, and it makes a rotation invariant and that sort of thing. So there's, all these different approaches have got their own features, if you like, but they're not all going to be good at everything. So I'm not going to talk about you know, what they are good at necessarily for each individual one, but block hash, for example, not very good if you've got smooth gradients, right? So it's, it's not very good at uh, animated images, for example, or scenes that are mostly just slow, gradual change. It doesn't match those very well because things they all look the same. And PHash, which does the wavelet transform with all that frequency energy magic, that's not very good at fractals and patterns, right? So if you've got a carpet from the 70s, or curtains from the 70s with all those patterns, the mad patterns, not very good at that. Can't tell them apart very easily because of the way the technology works. So they've all got their, their pitfalls, essentially. And a, a general pipeline for how this works. So we could take, say, a, a picture of Alison Hannigan and First thing we want to do is, that's, that's too many pixels, it's 4 megapixels, 10 megapixels, whatever it is. That's a lot of processing. So what we'll do instead is we'll shrink it down to fixed dimensions, which are usually really small, right? We're talking sort of tens by tens, 64 by 64, 33 by 32, something like that. Then we convert that to grayscale, because it turns out that, again, visually, the color doesn't add that much, weirdly. It's really more about uh, positional things, uh, the luminance channel, if you will is the thing that carries most of the data for us. And in fact, just to come back to JPEG, that's usually downsampling color. So we don't have full resolution of the color, we've got full resolution of the black and white, and everything else is kind of superimposed on that, and it turns out it looks about the same. So we convert it to that uh, grayscale image, and then if we're doing that transformation I was talking about, we'll do it at this stage. And then we extract features, right? But the features, we can't really go into very much, because it could be from the frequency domain, it could be from the pixels, it could be average color, all of that stuff, right? But that's the general pipeline. We scale it down, make it black and white, and then we do whatever we're going to do to it. But then we have to generate some set of values that make a hash, right? And for our case, a hash is just a sequence of zeros and ones of some fixed length that characterizes that thing. In this case, it happens to be a picture. So again, for, for block hash, because it's, it's the one that's easiest to understand, I think, that grid I talked about, you take the average color of every block, and you compare that with some larger segment and say, is it higher or lower than that average? And from doing that, you get a one or zero, right? Fairly straightforward, works really well. So you get, say, 64 bits or 128 bits, whatever it is, that's our thing that we want to compare. But now we have to figure out, well, how do we actually compare that, right? We've got, we've got hash, we've got a sequence of bits. What do we do with that? So uh, how, do we, how do we measure similar is really what I'm getting at. And pretty much in, in all the literature, there's this thing called the Hamming distance. You might have heard of a bit error rate or something similar to that. Basically, just count bits, right? I've got this sequence of bits. I've got that sequence of bits. How many of them are different? But because all of the hashes might be different lengths, that might not be that useful. So 54 difference on a hash that's 64 in length means quite a different thing from 54 difference in something that's 512 bits in length. So what you can do is just divide it by the length of the thing, right? And you get a percentage, effectively. So 0.5 is 50% of the bits are different. Zero is none of them are different. One, they're all different, right? So that's a, that's a distance metric. And if you flip that around, you get a similarity metric. But it's basically the same thing. But then we, we have to constitute a match, right? So how do we say this is the same, right? How do we get that picture of Bill and say, no, that's, that's the same? We want that to match algorithmically. We can do it with our eyes fairly easily, right? That's because our, our pattern matching systems in our brain are great. But automating that, Quite difficult. So we go through that whole process, we get these bit sequences for both images, and then we say, right, at some point, for some percentage difference between these hashes, I'm going to constitute a match here. So if it's less than 25% different, I'm going to say that's the same thing. All right, that's basically how it works. So I'll come back to that threshold in a little bit, because it turns out it's really important for these evaluations. So let's, let's see this in practice, right? Uh, there's a Python library called ImageHash where you can try a lot of this stuff. So AHash, WHash, down to PHash, they're all part of that library. BlockHash is 
external, but I really like it, so I include it in all my stuff. So if we take uh, this image from GovDocs, b2.png, and I convert it to a JPEG, like we talked about, all that binary data is just totally different, right? All the pixels, in fact, if we overlay them, mostly different because of the way JPEG does compression. It's lossy, so we cut out some of that information. But if we looked at them visually, we can still tell that would be the same picture, right? There's, there's no doubt. It's, it's basically identical as far as our eyes are concerned. So where we would get massive difference in the binary mechanisms, these perceptual mechanisms are saying, yeah, this is, this is the same thing. These are functionally identical. There's a zero difference in the hashes, in fact, in this case. And if I edit it a little bit, so I kept both of them as PNG here, just to see the edits you know, carrying the, the, the data. I changed the NASA logo at the bottom, and I added a little spaceship. And all of the hashes are saying, yeah, this is still basically the same. So 1% difference, 4%, up to 9, right? This one's actually still saying that. These are, can't see any difference, right? Apparently, the spaceships are invisible. It's got John Cena written on the side. So that looks good. That, that looks like it's doing the, the job, at least for things that are basically identical, right? And then if I give it two things that are not the same. So these images, quite clearly, apart from the fact that they look like they're maybe nice holiday destinations because I took them from Flickr, they're quite different, right? Compositionally, probably if I, you've got the sky and ground and that, that's about all they share, right? They're on Earth and they're kind of upright. That's, that's about it. So all the hashes are saying, yep, these, these aren't the same. These are quite different. In fact, some of them are saying they're, they're so different that they're coming around the other way back to being the same. Uh, but mostly, you can see a pattern there, right? They're saying there's a large disagreement. And what I'll come back to in a little bit is basically you want each of those bits to be a coin flip. So roughly 0.5 difference on average for things that are just not remotely related at all, right? So you kind of get that there, but not quite. It's also worth pointing out that I'm kind of skipping over a whole very increasingly massive set of the literature that talks about AI solutions. So if you saw this thing with Apple a while ago, they've got a solution called NeuroHash, which uses deep learning. And the difference here is that rather than coming up with some kind of heuristic where you're saying, oh, I care about color, or I care about edges, or I care about average color in this relationship to other, other blocks nearby, they're just like, yeah, we've got images, we've got many, 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 many images, and you figure out what's important in that blob of thing. And they get a number that kicks out, or that's the hash, right? Uh, yeah, that's good, and it works. Uh, apart from the backlash that it got in the literature when they were, uh, in the news when they were saying, yeah, we're going to deploy this to all the phones, you can attack this as well, right? So just because you've derived your functions from data doesn't mean it's going to work any better necessarily. It's still going to have failure cases depending on what you're trained on, depending on what features were selected there. So you, you land in much the same boat, except you maybe have less understanding of why it's broken. And in fact, these attacks are probably just, uh, they're attacking the, the models themselves, not even the thing they're modeling, if you like. So there's actually two separate GitHubs. The, the one that is referred to here has another like, set of mean pictures that match, essentially. But this one's saying the, is that Grumpy Cat? And the, the Doge, or Doge, whatever. These images are the same. It's basically saying these are identical, but they're clearly not, right? And probably a lot of the heuristic approaches wouldn't make that mistake. But we can do the same thing with MD5 as well, right? So MD5 and SHA-1, you can generate clashes on those. So there's gonna be an attack against everything but we're not even there yet. We're, we're still worried about cropping it and changing it to JPEG, you know? We're, we're not even thinking about people deliberately going out of the way to mess it up. So, hopefully that's not been too quick. I've been trying to, trying to keep it on time. I wasn't sure how long I was gonna go through uh, for this bit. So hopefully you never get an idea of roughly what we're trying to achieve there, right? We want things to match. We want it to do it in a visual way, and there's loads of different ways of doing that, but we're not necessarily sure at this stage what works and what doesn't for what use case. So the evaluation comes in because that's actually really important. That's like most of the problem, is making sure that for whatever case we're talking about, this works, or this technique is better than that one. So uh, if we're talking about sorting, right, and this is anyone that's ever done a sort of data, what's it called, data structures and algorithms module, right? They're typically talking about, oh yes, we've got sorts and we've got lists and dictionaries and they've all got different search properties, binary trees. It's sort of like that. You would roughly know at what scale, for what kind of lookup, what is the best data structure. If you're sorting stuff, you know roughly how those scale or you look it up, right? We wanna be able to do the same thing here. So we can make statements like 
phash doesn't like fractals, and blockhash doesn't like you know animated images because just it's just bad at those. But we've got a set of design requirements, right? So one thing, and again, if you're looking at projects, I, I don't know how many people are actually students here, but if you're looking for honors projects, master's projects, and you're thinking about just doing science, you need to define your criteria because I can say this matches, but I need to define what match means. Just like you thought about earlier with, does the black and white one constitute a match or does the cropped one constitute a match? So for our scenario, we're gonna have some set of criteria that says, yes, these are the same thing. Uh, so is it the composition, right? Is it colors, is it content, is it topic? Because it turns out that the search engine probably cares more about matching the topic. If I put in, uh, not with reverse image, but just if I type in beach, beach image, right? It's gonna give me any beach image, anything that looks like a beach, anything that maybe shares that topic or that content. If I put the image in and I'm doing a reverse image search, it might still be prioritizing things that are beaches, not things that look the same, if that makes sense. It's got a topic, it's got a, a model of what that, uh, what that semantic meaning is in mind. Whereas if I'm looking at the forensics use case, right? So we're typically talking about there was a picture and it was manipulated somehow. But we've got the source image. There's only one source image and it was changed somehow. Cropped, rotated, flipped, changed to bitmap, you know, whatever. They changed the contrast on it, for example. What we're trying to do there is find that image. We're not trying to find other images that are maybe in the same room, other ones that have the same composition, other ones that are equally horrifying. We're looking for that image and that alone, right? So the context and the scope is quite a bit different there. That's much more narrow in terms of definition. And we can usually think about it in terms of a classification problem. So it matches or it doesn't. And that's quite nice because that threshold I talked about earlier basically controls whether we decide it's a match or reject it as a match, which simplifies the, the evaluation a little bit, right? So threshold, if it's, a, uh, if we're thinking about distance, right? If you're within that distance, then you're a match. If you're outside of that distance, you're not a match. If it's supposed to match and it doesn't, then it's a false negative. If it matches when it shouldn't, it's a false positive, right? Those are the two things we're trying to control. So if you think about uh, an investigator, they've got 100,000 images on this drive, right? And that's probably not a lot. Basil mentioned the case earlier where the guy had 250,000 images, right? You don't want to go looking through all of that. You want to flag up the ones of interest, the ones that look like things we've seen before. But if my false positive rate is 10%, then suddenly I've got an extra 25,000 images to look at. So you want to minimize that. But also, if you're looking for dodgy CSAM stuff, you don't want to miss any of it, right? So your false negative rate should also be really low. So you've actually got these two competing things based on where you put that threshold that you can't necessarily piece at the same time. But we want to discover where we can put that threshold and then when this technique works well and when we can expect it to fall over. Because it's probably okay that it falls over if we know about it, right? And that was one of the problems with neural hash that people got really upset about is that there just wasn't evaluation. Like, you're deploying this thing, when does it fail? How does it work? Because if it breaks on certain classes of images, then all of a sudden there's gonna be loads of people with knocks at the door that shouldn't be getting it. So, let's walk through the, the pipeline, if you like, for doing evaluation. So, if you're interested in doing this sort of thing. First step, obviously, grab some images, right? You, you need a data set. Then you wanna generate a bunch of modifications for those images. So in this case, the kind of stuff I've done, uh, got the original image, recompress it, add a border around it, crop it, flip it on the x-axis, add a watermark, scale it up, Windows thumbnail, you know, that sort of thing, right? And we can look at them and say, yeah, they're, they're still all the same image. Whether the algorithms agree with us or not is a different thing entirely. So we've got data set, we know what to compare against now. Basically, we wanna see for all these algorithms, how well this original image matches each of these use cases, right? Step two is to quantify what we mean by different, or how different, I guess, as well. And the idea is that we want to take random images in that data set and just see, like, how different they are. So remember, if we looked at the uh, two different sort of holiday destinations before, and then one was like, oh, it's 0.5 different, the other one's 0.7 different, right? These are just random images. Sometimes they're gonna look kind of similar or the values are gonna come out very similar. So what we really care about is what is the distribution of the, the difference between random things? So that's what these are, right? This is just a Gaussian distribution that says, right, we've got kind of a, a narrow field around 0.5 for random things. And this red one's saying, ah, it's a bit wider. 
you know, there's quite a range of, of similarities and differences we can have on these images. And the reason this is important is because if I decide to put a threshold in, so I've been using 0.25, right, so let's just run with that. 0.25, I'm going to say anything beyond this down this side is a match, right? That's what we're going to consider a match. Well, before we've even done any modification, before we've even looked at images that are supposed to match, there's sort of a problem here. Because occasionally, we get stuff in here that matches regardless of whether it's the same or not. So this red one's obviously much worse, right? There's no, there's no um, probabilities on the left-hand side, but that's just much more likely that we're going to get some stuff matching by chance. So that's our false positive rate, essentially. So we could move that threshold down, right? We can move it all the way down here to what looks about 0.1, and then we're probably eliminating that. But as we'll see in a minute, we're now trading off against false negatives. But you need to look at this. If you don't understand this distribution, you can't make any sense of your data, right? And the reason for that is all the, all the hashes look different. They've all got different compositions. So PDQ, really narrow, right? Squishes things in in the middle. That's coin flip like pretty much every time, right? That's really good. Wave hash, not so good. That spreads out quite widely. So if you put 0.25 here, you're getting lots of stuff that matches there. Whereas if you put it here, you're getting nothing. So that, that's the gist of it, right? And some of the time, your distribution, like with color hash, is nowhere near the middle. That actually means we just throw that hash out. That means for most use cases, that's going to be garbage, right? And that's before we've even looked at modifications. This is just looking at random image to random image, which is why it's important to do. And also why I found it really frustrating that no one was doing it, which is why I wrote a paper on it, which I'll mention in a bit. Right, so what we did there for that first step was on the left. This is called inter-image, between different images. What we're now wanting to do is evaluate all of those modifications and stuff, right? So that's your intra-images within image, because we're considering these to all be the same. So that's, that's the within bit. The class of match is all the same image. So what we, because this should match, we want it to be close to zero distance, right? We, that's what we saw before. Do that compression, add the spaceship. Yeah, they're basically the same. It's almost zero difference. So your distribution isn't going to be normal in the middle of the thing. It's going to be a power law looking thing near zero. And that's what we're after, right? We want to model that as best we can because we want things to be zero, if possible. But in practice, they're not all going to be. There's going to be a bit of difference. There's going to be a bit of variation, right? So the threshold there now controls what's missing. So if it's above this threshold, we don't match it even when we should. So the longer this tail is, the more that bleeds into this side, the more stuff we're just going to miss. So you now imagine those two things overlaid. If you shift to the left or shift to the right, you're now trading off these two different things. False positive and false negative rate. I've already mentioned that. So this is what it looks like in practice. This is a neural hash, so that one Apple was going to deploy everywhere. If you scale the image up by 1.5%, sorry, 1.5 times, so increase by 50%, yeah, that's, that's mostly zero, right? They're all over to the left-hand side. That looks like it will match these really well. If you crop it, okay, suddenly it's not as good. The distribution's shifting up. The distances get larger when we should be matching, right? So we know it's not as good at that case. If you flip it on the x-axis, suddenly it all goes p-tong, right? If you have that 0.25 again, and that's just an arbitrary value, that's like half of the data set, right? Suddenly not matching. So the closer you bleed into that middle distribution, the worse you can separate the two classes of thing. So for mirroring on the x-axis, that's actually really damaging for that hash in particular. And it's not even the worst one, because block hash and PDQ are much worse at it, weirdly, right? PDQ is so bad at it that you literally could not tell whether it's the same image or just a completely random different image if you flip it on the x-axis, right? Block hash is not much better. It's basically the same. It's like, yeah, it's a guess, right? It's a coin flip, even though we would look at it and go, no, these are the same, what are you talking about? That's obviously more similar than the ram random other image of a beach but this is what I mean. This is the modeling problem. There's going to be these, these uh, characteristics introduced. And there's one more step, right? This is a bit more advanced. And this is something I've not actually seen many people do in the literature, is that we also want to model uh, random image to random image within the modification classes as well. So if I put a border around it, well, yeah, the, the images are more similar to each other because they both have black borders, right? If I took a picture of that wall and then I put a black border around it, you say, yeah, these are quite similar. If I took a picture of that over there where it's all blue and that's all white and I put a black border around both, they both share the border. So for us, they're, they're more similar than they would otherwise be. Well, it turns out, unsurprisingly, 
the data shows that as well. So for a lot of the hashes, if I add a black border, suddenly they stop being 0.5 flip a coin and they start being maybe 0.3 in terms of average distance to each other, right? That's bias. That means that that modification is introduced a bias that means you're unable or uh, less capable of telling random images apart from each other. They all start to look the same. So that's one of the last steps, right? And then the other thing is just generate metrics and graphs, which I'm going to skip over a little bit because it's quite complicated. But basically, the, the, the thing you want is that true, false, positive, negative rates. That's the main thing. And you want that for each of the classes of thing. So one of the mistakes in the literature that I've seen is that quite frequently they'll, they'll aggregate across everything, right? They'll say, oh yeah, we did crops and flips and upside down things, and I did watermarks, and we tried it across all these different things and all these different images. And then they give you one value. It's like, oh yeah, it's 0.7. Yeah, but why is it 0.7? Where does it fall over? Are you actually doing really well at a bunch of these cases and just falling flat on your face in two of them? Which ones, right? That's actually the important bit. So when you're evaluating anything like that, to do good science, you want to make sure you understand the nuance of the problem. Why does it fail? How does it fail? How could we fix it afterwards, right? These are the really important things, not 0.7 versus 0.9. That's just numbers. That doesn't really mean anything in practice. Uh, in terms of plotting and things, you can do like a receiver oper operating characteristics or area under the curve which summarizes that. Basically, you get some pretty graphs, but I'm not going to labor that too much because what you should really do is just download our toolkit for doing that. Right? So that's, there's a lot of stuff involved in there. There's lots of different steps. You should just download Phaser, which is our uh, library for doing this stuff. And it has absolutely nothing to do with one of my favorite shows of all time. Nothing at all. Totally unrelated. So what this does is helps you visualize that, that trade-off I'm talking about, right? So in the middle here, we've got, uh, this is a probability distribution, and these are error rates. All right, I'll, I'll just jump through this really quickly, right? Uh, so on, this is similarity rather than dissimilarity, right? So basically, the, we want it to be on the right if it matches. So this is the class that should match. These are the ones that shouldn't match. Hey, look, we can neatly divide those in two, right? They are, they are separate things entirely, which means we can pick a threshold in the middle of that, which will give us good trade-off between false positive and false negative. If they overlap a bit, that's that case I'm talking about where, okay, we're going to have some error rate and we can quantify that. But if they basically sit on top of each other, you can't tell these classes of thing apart. As far as you're concerned, they're the same thing. And your error rates are going to be abysmal, right? For both of these, it's like 70% wrong. So that's worse than flipping a coin at that stage. So that's roughly what you want to be able to do. When does it fall over? How does it fall over? What does it look like? And just really quickly, why would you want to do any of this, right? So I've, I've done it for images, for uh, comparing mostly CSAM stuff, uh, so the child sexual exploitation stuff, mostly for images, but you could also do it for malware, right? So malware matching is quite hard. That binary stuff I'm talking about can be really difficult to actually manage if you're repacking and re-encoding the, the malware all the time. So if you visualize it, especially visualize it in memory, then maybe these techniques that are meant for other use cases would work really well. And also, there's some opportunities for optimizing existing algorithms, right? Because we don't have to run straight into deep learning. In fact, we probably shouldn't, if I'm honest. But we could optimize existing techniques like phash. We could reweight things. In fact, we did a little bit of work on that that showed really quite bizarre stuff that half of the bits don't matter in the hash in some cases. So there's a bunch of work around that. It gets kind of bizarre. And there's also this sort of trade-off. So remember when I said, if you count all the bits that are different, well, where are the bits different? Hamming distance is just a global measure. Right? If all the bits that are different are in the top right corner of the image, that's lost. That information is lost in that measure. So there's actually a bunch of locality uh, information that we want to capture that global measures don't. And that's it. Hopefully that was useful. Um, the two papers I was talking about are here and here. Uh, not that difficult to find. If you just Google my name in Napier, you'll find my outputs. The GitHub for that library I'm talking about is here. One caveat is that don't use it until like next week because I have to patch and push things that I haven't got around to yet. But in, in principle, if you want to get involved with that or use that for projects or things or even at work, feel free to talk to me, ask me questions. Uh, I'm quite happy to be involved. But uh, yeah, any questions? Have we got time? <laughs> I don't know. I think we're probably okay. I don't know. If you want to ask questions and not have a break, that's fine with me. But you should probably have a break. You can come and ask me things afterwards and that's all right.